Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, everyone can hear me? That's okay. Great, welcome to back to the, the second session we have. Uh, and now we turn to Australia and Japan in a new regional order. And we'll really sort of pick, off, uh, pick up where we left off from that last question, that last panel about the US-China trade war. Um, but first we want to turn to the Australia-Japan bilateral re uh, relationship and uh, think about it, think about that bilateral relationship in its broader regional and global context. So both Australia and Japan face major global headwinds um, from the rising protectionism in the United States and parts of Europe. Um, and we've relied on the United States and, and Europe for global leadership in the past. Um, the trade war between the United States and China uh, continues to worsen, it threatens to spiral into a technology war, uh, and there's threats of economic decoupling. Uh, so the rise of China was going to be really difficult for us to manage anyway with the huge structural um, changes in, in regional and global power, but the Trump administration has made that much harder. Um, it's made that much harder with the uncertainty injected into the system, the undermining of global institutions, and the rules that actually we've relied on the United States to uphold uh, in the past and up until very recently. So Australia and Japan um, both share similar challenges in navigating uh, the alliance relationship with the United States, uh, increasingly unpredictable Trump administration, and managing the massive and complicated relationship uh, with China. So to help us understand all these issues, um, and answer some of the questions that were posed at the end of the last session. Uh, we have three panelists here. Uh, we'll start, I'll, I won't introduce everyone at great length because you have um, the bios in the packs, but Yasuki Todo is Professor of Economics at Waseda University. Um, I've worked a lot with Todo Sensei just over the last 12 months in the T20 process, Think 20 process, feeding in um, to Japan's G20 uh, agenda on trade and investment and globalization. Uh, and we have Amy King, who I think is familiar to everybody here, who's at the Strategic and Defence Study Centre here at the ANU, who's our go-to person, as you will all know, uh, on all things economics and security and the overlap, and the ma major adult supervisor on that um, for us. Uh, and then Melanie Brock, who runs a consultancy, um, but is really from the real world. Um, <laughs> and will give us a perspective <laughs> from Japan, where she resides, but also um, perspective of the bilateral relationship and how she sees uh, Australia doing from a base in Japan. Um, so we'll actually start by talking about um, supply chains, economic integration, uh, security and decoupling with a presentation from Todo Sensei. Okay, uh, let me walk around. Uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, be entertaining, but uh, I'm always telling my students uh, to walk around uh, in the presentation, so I have to be, you know, uh, I have to follow my own advice. Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, and you, uh, particularly Shiro, for inviting me to this uh, great conference. I'm very much honored to be here. And uh, today I would like to talk about the, how uh, Australia and Japan should deal with this uh, current new regional order. And let me start with this uh, uh, current uh, Japan-South Korea uh, trade dispute. In July, uh, uh, in July, uh, the Japanese government uh, uh, tightened uh, uh, controls on exports uh, of uh, three chemicals essential to uh, production of uh, semiconductors and uh, flat, uh, flat panel screens to South Korea. And in August, the potential target was uh, expanded to uh, products that can be uh, utilized for military purposes. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the Japanese uh, government is arguing that uh, this tightening of uh, export controls is uh, uh, solely for national security purposes, because uh, uh, previously uh, some exports from uh, uh, Japan to South Korea were uh, re-exported to uh, some other countries for military purposes. So the Japanese government is saying that uh, it is not ready to the um, uh, wartime labor issue, and also it is uh, often utilized uh, in international trade. So uh, simply saying, the Japanese government is saying that uh, uh, this uh, uh, export control is not affecting 
uh, trade or any e e economy in the world, including Japan, South Korea, and uh, other countries. However, I'm a bit uh, skeptical about uh, this argument because uh, uh, negative shocks uh, can propagate through global supply chains and uh, uh, international financial uh, networks. So, uh, uh, for example, one of my studies showed that uh, uh, neg negative shocks by the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 actually uh, propagated through supply chains very quickly, uh, affecting uh, the whole uh, Japanese economy, as uh, these uh, uh, figures show. And uh, uh, another research of mine examined uh, propagation of uh, 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 the, the Hurricane Sandy that hit the uh, US East Coast in 2012 uh, through global supply chains. Uh, and I found that uh, uh, pro uh, negative shock by the hurricane pro propagated to uh, the US firms. However, it didn't propagate to firms outside the US or US firms that have a transaction with uh, foreign uh, trade partners. So the implication is that uh, if firms are internationalized, then they have ability to substitute damaged uh, trade partners for new partners so that uh, they can mitigate uh, propagation effect. So uh, uh, that means uh, the diversification of your trade partners is quite important when you think about uh, uh, economic resilience. So uh, uh, given these facts, I uh, uh, predict uh, uh, two opposing uh, possible con consequences of uh, uh, Japan-South Korea trade dispute. One is that uh, both Japan, South Korea, and other countries in the global economy may hurt substantially. Uh, why? Because uh, Korean uh, semiconductor uh, companies like uh, Samsung are uh, hubs of, uh, uh, in the uh, global supply chains. And also, um, uh, not only the uh, direct uh, suppliers and customers, but also uh, uh, the indirect suppliers and customers, that means suppliers of suppliers, customers of customers, can be affected. So uh, the negative shock because of the export controls can propagate very quickly to many, many firms in the world. However, uh, alternatively, there can be uh, uh, another possibility that uh, damages may not be substantial. Uh, this is a case, particularly if the Japanese government actually uh, used the export control only for national security purposes, as it claims. So then the, uh, the negative shock can be minimum and the uh, propagation doesn't happen. And if uh, this, uh, this is also the case, if uh, Korean companies can substitute new partners for Japanese suppliers. Obviously, this is very bad for Japan, but uh, good for uh, South Korea and uh, other uh, economies in the world. And this argument can be applied to the uh, current US-China trade uh, uh, conflict or trade war, I could say. Uh, the US is now restricting exports to uh, Huawei, but the Huawei is uh, a, a huge hub in global supply chains. So uh, uh, the negative shock can propagate quickly to the US, to China, to everywhere. And uh, uh, recent uh, tariff wars have already uh, shrunk uh, trade between China and Japan, uh, as these figures shows. So, uh, uh, China and US. Uh, what China, did I say? China, China, China and US. Uh, trade uh, shrunk. Okay. Uh, taken from uh, Jetro data. Uh, but uh, however, despite uh, uh, these uh, trade conflicts, uh, decoupling of uh, Asia Pacific uh, economies uh, may be very uh, difficult. Uh, first, uh, because uh, we rely very much on China already. So these figures show the uh, share 
of uh, uh, China and other countries in each country's uh, uh, exports. And uh, uh, the blue ones, blue lines, are China's share. So uh, you can easily see that uh, uh, in everywhere, like US, Japan, uh, Australia, South Korea, it's China's share is increasing very much. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the orange lines show uh, the share of Japan, uh, yellow lines, US share, and then they are decreasing everywhere. So uh, uh, looking at South Korea, uh, it is uh, understandable that uh, uh, the South Korea is not hesitating to uh, fight against uh, Japan because the importance of uh, Japan has been declining substantially compared with uh, uh, China. And looking at China, uh, the US share, the Japanese share have uh, declined also, very drastically. So like uh, in 2000, uh, two countries account for 40% of uh, Chinese exports, but now only like uh, how much, uh, 20 something percent. So that means uh, uh, China has uh, uh, been successfully uh, di diversifying the trade partners so that uh, again, you know, China could uh, uh, fight against uh, the US now. So now let's look at uh, uh, some other aspects of uh, economic integration, uh, international research collaboration. So uh, this figure shows uh, research collaboration networks among uh, firms. So you can easily see that uh, the US, Europe, and China uh, are collaborating closely with each other now. And sorry, I couldn't show the uh, uh, Australian firms explicitly in this figure, but uh, Australian firms are uh, uh, mostly among the, uh, this uh, cluster of US, uh, Europe, and China. Uh, Japan, South Korea, less closely uh, uh, collaborating with uh, other countries. But still, you know, you can see that uh, uh, economic integration in terms of innovation uh, around the world. So uh, uh, given these facts, uh, what we, uh, we should consider is as follows. First, uh, economic integration uh, can promote uh, economic benefits generally uh, to all participants. But still, you know, sometimes as a, uh, uh, currently, uh, national security issues uh, can be more important than economic benefit. However, uh, we still need to consider that uh, uh, like a hostility uh, to, against uh, uh, foreign countries and economic stagnation can reinforce each other so that uh, uh, it uh, can lead to a devastating consequence. Uh, a typical example is the World War II. Now, actually, the, this uh, vicious cycle between uh, uh, like a closeness and uh, uh, economic stagnation uh, is uh, going on. So this uh, figure shows the that uh, uh, like uh, 20 to 40 percent of uh, citizens in developed countries think that the international trade creates jobs. That means the majority of people in developed countries are quite skeptical about benefits from uh, globalization. And looking at the uh, views of uh, uh, other countries, uh, for example, uh, it seems that Japan and South Korea simply saying hate each other. Majority of uh, Japanese and South Koreans uh, have an unfavorable view uh, of uh, the other. And uh, in, in the case of South Korea, it's increasing rapidly after the uh, trade dispute. And uh, this is also the case in, uh, in uh, the US and China relationship. <laughs> So uh, uh, what we need to do? I think uh, uh, still we should decouple uh, these economies because uh, uh, economic integration can uh, generate a lot of economic benefits. 
but still national security issue should also be considered. So one thing we can do is that uh, uh, we set up a transparent uh, trade rules for national security. So right now, actually, uh, what kind of uh, exports are uh, controlled or not, it's not very clear to uh, companies, so that the companies are hesitating to uh, 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 invest. For example, if you know, they know uh, everything, then they can decide uh, whether they, can, uh, they should invest in other countries than China or South Korea, but uh, they cannot because of uh, uncertainty. So uh, uh, we need to have uh, transparent and clear rules for the, uh, you know, uh, in the first place. And also uh, diversifying economic partners is very important, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is for resilience. And uh, in that sense, um, if transparent and clear rules are given, uh, firms may uh, um, uh, decide to invest in uh, uh, different countries uh, than uh, China, uh, for example, so that uh, uh, global supply chains or global value chains may be uh, reorganized uh, drastically. But it may be good for Asia-Pacific economies because, uh, as, I, uh, as uh, we see, uh, we rely very much or maybe too much on China. And uh, uh, this is uh, very risky for uh, economic resilience. I'm not saying that uh, China is a bad trade partner, but I'm just saying that uh, relying on a single country can be very risky. And uh, uh, finally, and most importantly, the relationship between Australia and uh, Japan should be strengthened. Uh, of course, I should say that. Uh, but uh, this is particularly important in the current uh, uh, time, because for Japanese, uh, we need uh, uh, neighboring partners uh, to, uh, you know, uh, 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 to deal with the uh, Japan-South Korea dispute. And I think uh, for Australia, uh, it is also important because uh, you need to diversify uh, your partner, trade partners or innovation partners, and also you need to diversify industries as well. So uh, the relation with uh, Japan can, uh, uh, could uh, be helpful for that uh, uh, purpose. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Todor san and, and you raise a number of, of issues and that does set the scene nicely. Um, I want to come back to a couple of specific issues later on and I'll just um, warn the panel I'm, I'm going to ask these questions. But um, you know, you said sometimes national security can be more important than economic benefits. Now that, as an economist, scares me a little bit. Um, you know, <laughs> does that conception of security include um, economic security? You know, who makes that judgment? Um, uh, are there better ways of sorting the priorities out? Um, you know, does a security agency make that judgment that security is more important than economic benefits? So I'll come back to Amy on that question, um, as well as Todor-san. And then you advocated for diversifying um, economic partners and industries, which sounds pretty sensible, I, I think, but um, um, you know, how to diversify? And I want to come back to, to Melanie on that um, to bring a business perspective. Um, you know, surely business um, is already diversifying. They see risks. Um, so if we're talking about diversifying further, are we talking about government intervention, perhaps? I mean, there are obviously going to be costs to diversifying. President Trump is showing how to reduce trade dependence with China quite spectacularly. I don't think you're advocating for that, but we'll come back to, to those sets of issues um, as well. Uh, but now I'll turn to Amy next um, and just step back a bit. And I want to ask you, Amy, about how Japan's been managing these big tectonic shifts in, in power in the region, but then also specifically how Japan's been managing the US relationship and the China relationship. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the, the presentation, I think, very nicely sets the scene of, of the range of economic and, and strategic, broader strategic challenges that a country like Japan is facing, which are particularly acute. 
Um, I think in a nutshell I would describe Japan's strategy over the past many years in some ways as attempting to double down uh, on the US-led order, the preferred order that it would like to see in the region, while simultaneously, I guess, subtly, subtly trying to augment that order from within. Uh, and that means by pursuing some key uh, uh, sort of forms of cooperation with China particularly in terms of uh, the economic partnership and, and infrastructure, uh, but also sort of uh, expanding some of the range of partnerships uh, between Japan and other key US allies or partners, Australia obviously being one of those, which are important in themselves for Japan de developing a sort of a broader range of security partnerships, but I think even more significantly are seen as a way of keeping the US engaged uh, in the wider Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific region, whatever we want to call it. So th this is a strategy that in some ways Japan has, has really pursued you know, since the early 1950s. It's not new. Um, it very much prefers you know, an ongoing US-led order, but it's not satisfied necessarily with the US vision of what that order would look like. Uh, and so, as I suggested, it's, it's looking at ways of, of working with other key partners, in particular China, uh, to reshape some of the kind of the under-regulated under areas of that order or some of the evolving areas of that order. So maybe you can go into that a little bit further on the Japan-China relationship. Um, can you give us some examples of what has Japan been doing with China? Sure. So, I mean, I think, as probably most of the people in this room would know, the Japan-China relationship was, was really at a low point for many years from about 2010, particularly in 2012, through to sort of 2014 or so. Uh, and things, I think, shifted pretty significantly uh, in 2016, 2017, um, and then were very much bedded down with a, a series of high-level bilateral visits between the two sides uh, in, in 2017 and 2018, and the signing in particular um, of a whole host of memorandums of understanding around joint cooperation between the two sides uh, on around 50 or so uh, joint infrastructure projects. Around that were a whole host of other sort of joint uh, agreements uh, and sort of a pledge to shift the relationship in a more cooperative direction um, and agreements on things like maritime and communications mechanisms um, to help deal with some of the, the immediate tensions in the East China Sea. But I think it's the area of infrastructure that's particularly interesting because of course, this is an area where Japan has had a long-standing kind of leadership role, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, has been a major provider of, of, um, of infrastructure to the region and through its role uh, in the Asian Development Bank. Uh, then China, of course, emerges on the scene with, with uh, both the AIIB and the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and I think for many uh, analysts, um, looking at the region, we would see these as, as fundamentally competitive uh, approaches. You know, China sort of offering something that, uh, that Japan and other countries were unable to offer. And certainly, I think there are some competitive um, elements to, uh, to the infrastructure uh, approaches being offered. And Japan has very um, clearly tried to demonstrate or differentiate what it offers from China, focusing in particular uh, on the quality, the sustainability, the economic efficiency, uh, the transparency uh, of its approaches to infrastructure investment in developing countries. Um, and, and partnering with more traditional country and traditional allies and partners like Australia and the United States um, in, in these kinds of, uh, in sort of enhancing its infrastructure investment in the region. But Japan is simultaneously trying to shape uh, China's very large uh, investments uh, through Belt and Road and other, and other um, initiatives, and particularly by working with a series of, of Chinese agencies. So we see cooperation between, for example, Japan Bank for International Cooperation and the China Development Bank um, uh, and, and a range of other actors where joint MOUs are being signed, where Japan is trying to get the Chinese partner to sign on to uh, its, its own high quality principles around infrastructure investment. Uh, and, and the Chinese side is actually uh, willing to come to the table uh, and actually willing to sort of, uh, and, and if you speak to sort of Chinese uh, analysts who work on the Belt and Road, uh, they would say that they see Japan's practices as being kind of the, the, the world's best standards in, in, in many regards. So they see some uh, I think virtue in, in working with Japan on this. Um, Japan, I think, is, is playing a really creative role here in 
trying to multilateralize its sort of high quality principles through the G7, through the G20, um, most recently at the, at the Osaka G20, but also working with the key kind of uh, country, China, that uh, is perhaps seen to be not playing by the same standards um, and trying to, I guess, shape those uh, through close engagement with, with Chinese um, institutions rolling out infrastructure projects. Now, we're still at the kind of the normative level, I guess. We're yet to see a lot of this being rolled out in practice. So, so that will be the next stage of, of analysis, I think, in looking at, of, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, I suppose, of, uh, of, of what that looks like on the ground. But certainly, I think we're seeing quite a bit of activity there on the Japanese side. So while um, Abe has been very successful with President Trump mm -hmm. in creating a close relationship, and I think we'll hear a lot about that after lunch in the session on politics, um, but also getting reassurances on Article 5 covering Senkaku Islands and the, the territorial areas under dispute. Um, and then effectively agreeing to buy a lot of corn right. as, as a <laughs> price for, for some of that agreement in the latest round of negotiations, trade negotiations with the United States. Japan's um, successfully shaping, well, coming closer with China, but shaping the, the big Chinese external Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, as you mentioned, it's not part of the Belt and Road Initiative, but these joint infrastructure projects, um, you know, Japan's not going to undertake them unless they uh, um, agree to the standards and principles. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the rhetoric, at least, of the second Belt and Road Forum, very much adopting the, the quality infrastructure principles mm -hmm. um, that Japan has been pushing, as you said, in the G7, G20. Um, so before I, I move to mm -hmm. Melanie and ask a question, How's Australia been navigating the China and Australia relationships? Well, I think, I mean, there's, there's an enormous amount that could be said there, and, and clearly, I think it's a, it's, it's a relationship that Australian governments, analysts, the Australian government and analysts have, have regarded as very important, as clearly creating enormous ruptures in how we think about kind of the regional order. But what our relationship with China should actually be and the strategy we need to get there, I think, is something that we've, we've yet to see a sort of a clear answer on. Now, Scott Morrison's um, major speech um, uh, on the eve of the G20, I think, went a lot further in, in sort of basically explicitly stating that Australia wanted to work closely with China and with the United States in, in reshaping uh, an order that both could participate in, in acknowledging that this was an order that was under strain and that, that both sides needed to, uh, to do more um, on, on areas that were, as I said, under-regulated and um, that to, to, to make an order, particularly on the, in the economic and, and trade sense, that was in the interest of both sides. Uh, I think that's very positive um, and sort of sets out a sort of a a view of the region that is more in line with many of our partners in Southeast Asia, um, in particular countries like Singapore, uh, which is helpful if you want to you know, work with other countries in the region in pursuing a, a joined up strategy. We haven't then yet sort of gone the next step, I think, in thinking about what, what we might do productively with China uh, to actually make that vision a reality. And so I think here, looking to some of the, the ways in which Japan has perhaps put that into more concrete practice might be helpful for Australia. Um, uh, and actually coming up with some uh, serious um, experiments, policy initiatives that, um, that actually put Australian and Chinese businesses or government agencies um, together to actually nut, nut out some of the kind of the areas of mutual misunderstanding, for instance, or uh, areas that we actually might have um, complementary approaches to, to aid, for instance, uh, development uh, in, in, in the Pacific uh, might be ways in which we could think about um, kind of putting some real policy mm. uh, in place to sort of to meet that vision. Okay. Um, Melanie, I want to ask you about the Australia-Japan bilateral relationship, but before I do, maybe do you, sitting in Japan and working with business, um, how do you see the difference in approach between Australia and Japan in how we deal with China or the United States, say? So, um, Amy paints a picture of a, a Japan that's a little bit more strategic and a little bit more um, clear-headed in what it wants from China, perhaps, than Australia. Do, do you buy that? Um. 
Can I say something before I answer that giant, tricky, um, <laughs> mega, mega question that could put me into great strife by um, <laughs> offering a few caveats over what I'm about to say in any case. Um, I just also, first of all, wanted to say thank you um, for inviting us to be on this panel because um, it's been a long time in the Australia-Japan space that uh, we've had a panel of gender balance. So for that, I'm grateful. <laughs> Uh, long may that rain. Um, so all those on Twitter accounts, send that out now. Um, the second thing I'd say is that unlike um, our former speaker, Todd says, I'm going to show Peter Drysdale that I actually can do as I'm told occasionally and I'll remain seated throughout my process. Um, because um, uh, that's just how I'm going to do it. But also thirdly to say that in the program my hair is quite um, dark. And uh, I have not, because I live in Japan, aged um, dramatically. It's just that I've uh, embraced the, uh, the new um, black, uh, which is the grey. Um, but I think, uh, you know, for Japanese business at the moment, and I certainly can't speak on behalf of all Japanese business, and it's only, um, it's hard for me, I guess, because I'm a generalist, and I just happen to live in Japan, and I hear a lot of things, and I am told a lot of things, um, which I try and um, take on uh, face value, but uh, later look at that through my own um, prism, which is, of course, being an Australian based in Japan. So when I look at the, the Japan-China relationship, I'm reminded of conversations that I've had with senior Japanese business leaders who are quick to remind us of the importance of the commercial relationship between Japan and China and the very stable nature of that relationship. And I'm seeing that at the moment with Korea, that the business leaders will very quickly say, look, it might be the case at political level there's a great range of um, angst and antagonism and, 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 and promotion of anti-Korean and anti-Japanese and vice versa media, but that the businesses are in fact trying to deal with this uncertainty and this pressure by doing what they do, which is relying on those commercial um, partnerships and, and in, you know, embarking on new investments or um, posting more people to those countries and the like. So I think there's a great um, importance. I think the business community can in fact show us what's really happening over and above some of the, um, the noise. And in global, sort of, in times of global uncertainty, I think that it's it's trickier for the Japanese business community than ever before, um, because of issues like Brexit, for example. Um, at, at the same time as they've had great political stability with the Prime Minister, who's there, Abe, and I think they welcome that political stability and they they thrive on the fact that they have had this terrific sort of um, administration in place. They've had to deal with the U.S. Uh, China the US-Japan trade discussions at the moment and the, you know, the uncertainty that that brings Japanese agriculture, Japanese business, etc. They've had to look at the North Korea situation. They now have got the Korea um, Peninsula and its problems. They've got the Korea, Japan and US security issues to deal with. They've got all of the issues that have been created today by um, the Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. So there, there are a number of areas where Japanese investment um, trends uh, um, you know, dri are driven by people who are having to make decisions based on the information that they have. And it's changing so quickly that it's very, very difficult for people to keep up. Insofar as how I see that plays out for Australia, Japan, once again, I'm not a professional, like, um, I'm not an analyst, I'm not an academic, so I don't certainly have that, that background. But what I do see is that there is a tendency for people to talk about the importance of the Australia-Japan relationship in amongst this global, or these, this period of global uncertainty, without coming up with the next um, set of ideas, I think, about how we can embrace that. And I take your point about perhaps agencies having more discussions. You were talking about Australia and China, for example. But, but those things are obviously taking place, and we've got Bruce Miller here who knows of the great change that took place during your time as ambassador, and also Murray, Murray McLean, who saw a big shift through a um, period of, tri of an, a commitment to trade liberalisation, as it could be. So I think those initiatives are there. But where I, and you'll forgive me just to go, for going on a bit, but I, I feel that the Australia-Japan relationship just needs a great big push. Um, <laughs> it needs a big oomph moment. Um, and I don't know who is responsible for that. I, don't, I think it's easy to say it needs to be business, um, and I think that's important because they're driving it. It's easy to say it needs to be leader to leader, but that's unfair on both of those leaders to take that. It's easy to say that something like this is driving it, and whilst it's adding to that. But I think that we need to, um, we need to be mindful of how we engage with 
uh, younger um, audiences in terms of the Australia-Japan relationship. I think we've got a tendency to be a little bit old about it, and I'm obviously in that pack. Um, although in Japan, I'm quite young, I must say. <laughs> so, so I love that. And, you know, that's why I live there. Don't ever, ever worry about that. But I do think that, you know, um, I feel strongly that the Australia-Japan relationship is solid, and I feel that it's built on great foundations and the great work that's been done by so many people, including in this room. But I just wonder, are we doing enough now and today. I think we should turn to our media and look at how they play this for us because I know in the time that I've been in Japan, which is now nearly 30 years, we've now only got one correspondent working for an Australian, it's the Australian um, uh, ABC, which means that stories about Japan just simply don't get reported back here. And so I think it's, um, it's up to all of us in our various engagements to uh, raise that profile such that we can have a better discussion about is, are we doing enough? Is Japan doing enough? Because without looking at ourselves, we possibly can't then call on Japan to take a stronger play in what we do. Um, to your point um, earlier about how that plays out in the security piece in particular. Did that answer anything? Probably not. <laughs> it answered a lot and raised a lot more issues. And I should just make a plug for your uh, regular column in the Fin Review, Postcards from Tokyo. Postcard from Tokyo. So the next one's on day today. 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 Okay. Right, yeah, I was just checking it, but I think it's um, probably not the... Uh, well, anyway, it's a bit rushed. But I, um, <laughs> but, I, um, but I talk in that one about brand Australia and... and you know, are we doing enough to look at, are we doing enough to listen to our Japanese colleagues about what they want from um, Australian tourism? You know, we've got all these wonderful um, uh, areas of, of focus, I think, in the Australia-Japan business and commercial relationship, but are we listening enough to what Japanese are telling us, or are we really um, simply pitching um, a boomerang and a kangaroo too often. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to say it. Sorry, no. <laughs> Quiet again. So, so, Amy, whether we get that oomph and, and sort of um, elevate the bilateral relationship or not, what can Australia and Japan do together? And, you know, we share a lot of um, similar challenges. I um, think we can maybe think about the two countries as anchors in, in this part of the world, um, interested in maintaining openness and stability. Um, what can Australia and Japan do in this environment? I mean, I think there has to be a first prior question is, before we think about what, we, what can we do, is what do we actually want from the relationship uh, and from the broader region as well? Um, because unless that's reasonably closely shared uh, in, in, um, in what we want from, e from each other uh, and from the, the broader regional order, I think, I think any uh, kind of initiatives will be fairly misplaced or sort of potentially go nowhere. Um, and look, I think there is a large degree of overlap in, in terms of things that, that, that both countries want. Um, they clearly have a, a, a deep commitment to the multilateral order. To, to, to trade liberalisation, to increasing that liberalisation to other sectors, um, to a security order that is rules-based and uh, and open to um, uh, kind of the, the provide security for for countries of all sizes, you know, large and small. I think there's also a degree of overlap in view, which is helpful. That um, while both are clearly US allies and would prefer. Uh, the United States to uh, be the leading power in the region, um, and, and you know their, their precise views on that, I think, you know, are, are clearly changing to some degree. Um, they are they are both of the view that orders do need to change. Um, you know, Japan has had a long history with itself being a rising power within a US-led order, uh, and an order that, that was fairly stubbornly resistant. You know, when Japan was rising in the, in, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s and, and putting forward initiatives and, and trying to have a greater you know, say and voting rights uh, you know, at the IMF and, and, and WTO, uh, that, was, that was fairly heavily resisted in, in, in many ways that are not dissimilar to, to sort of the language and rhetoric that we see uh, you know, coming out of the United States today. Um, but Japan has quietly sort of tried where it can to, to, to reform the order through you know things like the Asian Development Bank, uh, through you know working with Australia on APEC and these sorts of issues. So, I think that sort of shared history uh, is actually a really important part of the um, 
of the relationship, but it means, so it means thinking, well, okay, if, if we're both countries that have a history of, of participating in an in evolving order, uh, what do we want from that order to change in the, in, in the future? And, and I think for both sides, it's, it's clearly looking at that, that key relationship between the US and China and finding ways uh, to, um, you know, strengthen rules around intellectual <laughs> property, uh, intellectual property protection, or uh, transfer of technology, uh, or perhaps thinking more creatively about some of the key security challenges between the U.S. and China uh, and other Southeast Asian states, and how they may be modified. So, so I think yeah, there is a lot that Australia and Japan could be productively doing together. Okay, so that would suggest that when our prime minister says this is the trade war we had to have, and just implies that we let it play out. Um, you know, we're not innocent bystanders here, no, Australia no. and Japan. So, Tolosan, maybe turning to you, um, you s looks like yeah. you want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> done. You're welcome to. But also, what can Japan be doing now? Um, it's not just um, an innocent bystander, obviously, in this space, and, and just pick up the pieces after US and China either come to a deal or further, um, further damage the system. What, what should Japan be doing? So you mean for the japan australia relationship? For the US-China uh, trade war. So, uh, first of all, I, I would like to uh, say something about the Australia and Japan re uh, relationship. So Melanie just said that uh, uh, we need a, like a big push. But I think uh, this uh, trade conflict uh, uh, can be a big push because it's uh, uh, you know reorganizing uh, everything, uh, 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 including global supply chains and national security issues. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, now uh, we are given a great opportunity to rethink about uh, our relationship between us. And also, uh, 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 but uh, still the new relationship uh, should no, should be quite new. I mean, it shouldn't be like uh, you know Australia exporting a beef and uh, a PG to and uh, Japan exporting uh, automobiles. Uh, it's not like that. I think uh, so. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, innovation is uh, very important uh, in the economic integration. So uh, I think uh, more uh, you know we need a, a stronger. Uh, relations uh, uh, between us in terms of uh, uh, innovation, like a research collaboration. So actually, I'm uh, now in, uh, in visiting uh, the University of Sydney uh, since uh, last uh, April uh, and doing a research collaboration, uh, joint research uh, with uh, my colleague in the University of Sydney. So that's a good example. So I, I think uh, uh, in that sense, uh, the Japanese government uh, and also, of course, uh, the Australian government can support uh, these uh, research collaboration between us. So that's a very important issue, I think. But do we just, yeah, Melanie? Oh, I was just going to, um, I completely agree with you on that point of um, how we drive, or, or how we drive it in these rather sort of uncertain times. Mm. And I think that it's very quick to call on government to sort of take that lead and to be the drivers of that. But I think it's incumbent on business to, to look at what those opportunities might be in that very tricky time. Um, I saw today that the Nikkei had a piece on um, Australian Echo coffee cups, you know, like um, that we don't, and I'm very grateful to the student who bought me a coffee today, thank goodness <laughs> for you, but, uh, and I felt terrible that I'm about to speak about the Echo cups or whatever they call them here, mm -hmm. what are these recycling, recyclable coffee yeah, cups or something, yeah. and of course in Japan they're simply not a feature of your daily um, purchase um, because everything is either in a coffee um, can um, from the, the um, vending machine, or it's from Starbucks, and it's you know it's some um, paper. But I thought that was an interesting story to be carrying to be carried in the Nikkei mm -hmm. about Australia. And if I was an Australian business, uh, if I was an Australian business that was create like manufacturing or you know marketing those coffee cups, I'd be up there tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, drive like trying to build on that because I think it, it means that you know at this time when everybody's saying yes, one of the important relationships that we have is Australia Japan because of everything else that's going on here then we should be reading the trends in Japanese, um, uh, sort of in Japan, mm -hmm. i.e. this move to echo, you know, to be a, a more focused on environmental issues. Um, we should be looking at that and then on that particular issue, saying, okay, we're gonna ship, like, send up the company tomorrow, but it's very hard for business, I think, to focus on Japan, because they simply haven't, and that they see all the benefits in China. And so it's become this, them or, like, China or Japan. Um, on many areas, I think, and that's simply not the, the case. The other thing I'd say is that um, one, somebody once described the Australia-Japan relationship 
as a relationship of an old couple, an ma old married couple. And I think it's an atrocious um, analogy. I think, it's, I think it's mean also to all of those married couples who actually love each other and love each other's company. Um, because it's suggesting that it's tired, that it's, um, that it's lacking any oomph, maybe. Um, you know, and that, it, that, it, and that it's need sort of, it needs, and it needs a trade war to, to revive it, or to revive it. And, and I, don't think, I don't think that's the case. I think the Australian-Japan relationship's in good in good form, but I don't think we do enough to think about where we could very quickly and nimbly jump in and fix those stories up. I don't know. Okay. Well, yeah. well, let me um, open it up to the floor in, in a second. Uh, but sure first, you, can I answer to your last question? Oh yes, please right. answer my I question. Think I That's even better. Answer to your question. <laughs> so, uh, so more generally. I think uh, what we need to do now is to stop the very catastrophic uh, uh, consequence, like uh, the actual war, not rather the you know, trade war. So uh, actually, I'm an economist, international economist, so I like to say uh, always opening up the economy is good. And I, I said that actually uh, last year when I did the uh, presentation in front of a Shiro in Japan. But uh, now things uh, uh, went too far. Uh, if you look at the Japanese uh, uh, websites, you know, uh, every day, you know, people write a very, very bad thing about South Korea. So I think uh, uh, simply saying, okay, opening up uh, uh, the economy is very good, so uh, we need to do that. It's not enough uh, at this moment. So uh, I think at, at least uh, we should, uh, uh, you know, take uh, uh, national security issues uh, into account uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, achieve uh, uh, like a soft landing. So that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, the big issue now. So uh, in that sense, uh, 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 again, uh, the, the clear rule, trade rules. Uh, setting up clear trade rules is the first step for that uh, matter. And uh, of course, uh, in, in that sense, uh, the governments uh, of uh, everywhere should do something. I suppose in one sense, just opening up to trade has never been enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Australian experience, experience of a lot of other countries, um, shows that you need flanking policies, a strong social safety net, you've got to make sure the gains from trade and technological innovation are spread across society to be able to sustain that openness. And if you don't get those things right, you know, exhibit A is, is the rise of Trump and the rise of protectionism and nationalism. But you did bring us back to a point you raised that I wanted to talk about on the balance of economics and security. And I might bring Amy in, into this because um, you know, Todo san said it's not always about opening up our security risks, but how do we balance these? Because should we be listening to the security agencies and reducing our economic interdependence with China, for example? Should Japan be doing so? Should Japanese business be discouraged from investing in China with policies or other incentives? So I guess there's, there's a couple of ways we can answer that question. I mean, the first is it's sort of an immediately immediate policy question. and. And, and pointed out by Toto san about how a government might respond to an immediate national security concern with, with sets of policies. And, and Japan, Australia, and others have, have put limits in place to prevent, for example, Chinese investment in, in 5G infrastructure. But I think this question about the relationship between national security and economic uh, interdependence is a much, much, much deeper one. Uh, and here, looking at the Japan-China or the US-China relationship uh, sort of over the long term is really instructive. Because these are relationships where, in spite of the fact that there has been a deep sort of adversarial uh, security relationship between the two countries, there have been equally important economic ties. It's never been a trade-off. Uh, and, the, and these countries have actually not thought about it in terms of a trade-off. So if you look on the Chinese side, for instance, in, in why they pursued such close economic ties with Japan uh, from you know, the minute after World War II is over, and in fact, during the war as well, but we won't get into that, but the, from the, you know, the minute after World War II is over, it's because of the national security threat that Japan poses. It's because countries say, well, we need access to technology, to infrastructure, uh, to sort of indus industrial goods. Uh, we need uh, those things to make ourselves secure, to develop not only our economies, but also our militaries. Uh, and where do we get that? Well, we get that through trade. We get that through economic openness with third-party countries. 
looking at the US-China relationship again, um, and, and Hugo Meyer's work is really useful here, in thinking sort of much more recently about how different agencies within the US Department of Defense and elsewhere have thought about that relationship with China, they very actively recognize, this is particularly during the George H.W. Bush and, and Clinton administrations, that it would actually harm US not only economic interests but national security interests if they completely blocked off all transfer of critical technologies with China because they'd lose a really fundamental market. China was going to get those things any, anyway on the open market from Japan or, or from Europe. And the key goal, actually, was for the United States to stay one step ahead. Uh, and by limiting your, your economic uh, interaction with China, by preventing you know, top scientists from Chinese institutions from studying in, in the United States, uh, by preventing that, that economic and, and intellectual and technological engagement, you're actually harming not only the US economy, but also the US national technology. Now, that's, that's a view that has clearly shifted uh, under the Trump administration. But I think the fundamentals of that, uh, of, of that explanation have not changed. And so, in fact, the deep, the deep problem at the heart of, uh, of Trump's, I don't want to call it a strategy because it's not a strategy, it's sort of a, a bunch of kind of uh, thought, bubbles. thought bubbles and tweets and such, <laughs> is that decoupling is, is, is ultimately going to harm the United States. And the only way for the United States to remain competitive in this area is, is to pursue engagement in China, with, particularly in technologies where China is now actually moving ahead. Cutting oneself off is not actually going to, to aid the United States in this area. So it's, so it's economic integration that mitigates security risks. Yeah, and, yeah. and looking at the Japan-China case, Melanie, as you said, Japanese firms um, that have invested in China, they constrain behavior, the, the worst nationalistic aspects of um, uh, behavior by Japanese politicians, in fact, Chinese politicians too, that need Japanese technology. So, what well, about this idea? Well, it's the same idea? in Korea at the moment, right. whereby, you know, you've got, as, as you, you suggested there, every day some very um, uh, inflammatory um, statements, well, a lot of inflammatory statements being made in the press every day, on both sides, of course. And uh, one of the um, areas of great um, change in Japan over the last three or four years has been the influx of foreign tourists. And of course, the second largest market for um, Japan of um, inbound tourists is Korea. And, uh, in, and the, I think it's close to 8 million tourists came last year. And they're predicting that a third of those um, tourists won't come to um, Japan as a result of the Japan-South Korea rift fight, whatever you like, you know, of, uh, issues. Um, what that does, of course, is it impacts on um, business communities in the Kyushu region, mostly, and Western Japan. And if the Japanese central government's push has been anything in the last um, while, and related to the Rugby World Cup, of course, is regional um, revitalisation. And so, of course, that impacts directly on some of those areas that the central government has been trying to support. So sometimes these things can't be seen in, in just a, in, a, in a simple exercise. But the Korean is playing out daily in Japan at the moment in the press. And the, the um, audience, the, um, what do you call it, the... Um, ratings for the programs whereby the commentator is, of course, more, um, uh, well, well, vicious sometimes in their statements, of course, are shooting right through the, the roof. So. Oh. Okay, I'm um, managing time poorly, but we'll finally get to the questions. We've got a first question here. We'll take two or three at once and then and get the panel to respond. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to go first, um, uh, improving the gender balance of the questions <laughs> from the floor. Um, Harriet Bailey, I'm from um, CSIRO, um, CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. Really pleased to hear um, more brought out in this panel about the importance of research collaboration and that science and technology aspects. We've been talking about um, needing a big push. Do you think that increasing or how much do you think increasing our research and scientific collaboration can actually help in that? We've talked, you know, there's a common, common understanding that that helps with our, you know, increasing our people-to-people -people links, but how much economically do we think that that can really be part of improving our economic integration? Right, the next question up there, and then we'll follow with a question up. Um, so this is probably for Dr King first, um, but in talking about the nexus between security and economic issues, at least looking in Australia, it seems that often issues that could kind of fit into that nexus, so things like uh, foreign investment in Australia or like aid in the Pacific, are often very heavily dominated by security discourse in the media and are often debated institutionally in security dominant spaces. So like the question around joining the AIB was carried out by the National Security Committee of Cabinet. So I guess I was just curious, 
uh, if you, it, when we look at Japan, do they have a similar problem with these sorts of hybrid issues being very heavily securitized, or are there lessons we can learn about how to better conceptualize them in that sort of hybrid way, the sort of way that they exist? Two great questions. We'll follow up with a third. Just uh, stop there. Hi, I'm Nina. I'm really happy to be here, uh, hearing insights from wonderful panels. Um, I have a question uh, to Professor Toto. Um, I agree with his uh, argument in a sense that sometimes national security is more important than economic benefits. And I uh, agree that we have to diversify economic partnership with other countries. Uh, but I have a slightly different view when it comes to the argument that uh, bilateral relations between Korea and Japan are similar to that of uh, US and China because there is a strategic rivalry between US and China, but there is not kind of that kind of problem between Japan and Korea. Uh, we have, uh, Japan and Korea have cooperated in various uh, areas, and two countries even are sharing very sensitive military information through uh, bilateral and trilateral international agreement. And I heard that Korea is party to the four major international export control regimes. So I'm wondering why uh, you think that relations between Korea and Japan are similar to that of US and China. And my second question is, is uh, you said that we have to develop uh, trade norms, transparent trade norms for national security. So how do you think uh, that can be, uh, ha that can happen, po be possible, uh, preventing other countries uh, from using that kind of trade norms, just uh, justificating their uh, expert uh, restra uh, restrictive measures? Thank you. Okay, who would who'd like to go first? Yeah. <laughs> so actually, uh, the first question is uh, excellent because I uh, have done the uh, uh, research on this, <laughs> the effect of uh, collaboration. So basically, I found that uh, when a firm uh, does uh, uh, international research collaboration, then the uh, quality of uh, its innovation uh, measured by uh, paid in citations, and the number of paid in citations improve uh, by like uh, 30%. Uh, compared with 50% uh, uh, of the effect of uh, uh, domestic co collaboration. So uh, uh, the effect of uh, international collaboration is quite high. And actually, uh, when you look at the effect by country, the China benefited uh, uh, substantially, like uh, the effect of uh, collaboration, uh, international collaboration on Chinese firms. Uh, innovation performance is like a hundred percent or more. So uh, uh, obviously, the uh, Chinese firms learned a, a lot from uh, um, research cooperation with uh, uh, mostly uh, U.S. Uh, firms and uh, universities. So uh, uh, in this sense, actually, uh, the, uh, President Trump. It's not too wrong. Uh, you know, Chinese are benefiting uh, greatly from uh, uh, cooperation. And uh, uh, about FDI, uh, so uh, in Japan, uh, we also have uh, uh, regulations on FDI uh, inflows, and uh, uh, the government can restrict uh, FDI because of the security issues. But uh, uh, um, I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, FDI, actually the, the uh, uh, FDI inflows to Japan is uh, too small. So compared with other countries, uh, it's almost negligible. So I think uh, uh, FDI should be coming more to uh, 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 to Japan. So in that sense, I, I think I'm afraid that, that the government has used uh, too much uh, the the restrictions on uh, FDI, but still uh, 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 the, the, they can regulate. 
And also uh, uh, the similarity between uh, Japan-South Korea relations and uh, U.S.-China relations. I didn't say they are similar, but uh, 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 the conclusion from the uh, uh, Japan-South Korea analysis that uh, uh, the negative show can propagate uh, through uh, supply chains can be applied to the U.S.-China relationship. And uh, what is the last one? The well, you don't have to answer all the questions. Okay. Let me just press okay. you. Let me just press you briefly. Um, you said so. Trump's not wrong on the research collaboration <laughs> thing because China seems to be gaining relatively more from mm -hmm. collaboration, and you'd expect that as a as a catch up economy, um, in a way. Yeah, but, that's right. You're not advocating. You're not suggesting that research collaboration is a zero sum game, of course. No, yeah, no, 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 of course, uh, of course, uh, the U U.S. firms are also benefiting from uh, international collaboration. Right. But, uh, okay, yeah. Millie? Oh, I just wanted to answer the question, um, it, where I can, um, on research. And uh, I think that this is an area, obviously, I would advocate much more research, especially between Australia and Japan, but maybe also Australia, Japan and third country, as, as businesses looking at engaging in third country with Japanese capital and Australian um, uh, expertise in particularly Asia Pacific, say, for example. But um, I would encourage um, universities where it's possible, or think tanks or groups like CSIRO, for example, to work with some of the existing networks in Japan. And this is where I think we can get that oomph going through some of the younger um, groups. Um, you know, for example, um, uh, the Australian New Zealand Chamber of Commerce, it's not certainly a young group because it's been going for quite some time, but um, it, uh, it, it would very much welcome <coughs> some opportunity to look at some of the, op the possibilities. Um, the Australia-Japan Youth Dialogue. The Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee's um, uh, future leaders. I can imagine that embedding or somehow collaborating or working with some of the people who are active in those groups would be terrific for um, for for the institutions back here. But more importantly, for getting that on the ground expertise about what is in fact happening. And the other thing I just say at the very end is that I've, I've talked a lot about young people, young people, and old isn't bad. Let's face it. <laughs> um, in Japan, we have this absolutely wonderful um, system called the. Shidiba Jinzai, um, and anybody with grey hair is, of course, Shidiba. And, um, and so I have a sm very small business, and so I was wondering how I could hire, because as um, Sakaki Bada sensei was saying, there's simply no opportunity um, to, it's very, very hard to hire anybody in Japan at the moment. So I um, rang the local council, and for 20 years or 20, 30 years now, I've been registered as a Shidiba Jinzai something something person. <laughs> and, uh, and I put out the, a request for somebody who would help me with just basic um, bookkeeping, really. And uh, I had two uh, applicants come, and uh, and one was just to help me sort things because I'm a bit of a mess. And uh, and so I asked for uh, two applicants to come and meet with me and they presented their CVs. And of course their CVs always have a photo and their age, which of course is hideous in that it, you know, let's do research on that and how it impacts on <laughs> labour flow, etc. But uh, I was fascinated to see that one of the women was 75 and she was going to be doing all of the bookkeeping for me. And 78 for the woman who's helping to just keep myself in, in sorts. And, uh, and, and it reminded me that there is just incredible wealth in the, um, in the uh, workforce whereby they are simply not able to work um, anymore in structures like we've been discussing, and but there's a, that opportunity. So maybe research around um, ageing and research around gender and research the, uh, in pure practical um, areas where we can, as, an, an, as Australia and Australian businesses, learn more about what challenges we're likely to face in our own um, futures anyway. Sure, um, should I just answer the question? Yes, we, we don't have any more hands <laughs> flying up, so we might uh, let Amy have the final word. And oh, then, sure, and then okay. <laughs> <laughs> I better, oh, make, Amy, better make this <laughs> significant. Um, I mean, a good question, and I think, um, yes, we see very similar uh, stovepiping uh, on the Japanese side, and one of the reasons why I think we see this mixed approach to uh, Cooperative infrastructure with uh, with China on the one hand, but then also the sort of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy with the US and others on the other, is that we have a competition between METI pursuing the, the relationship with China in particular and leading in that, uh, and MOFA on the on the. Um, uh, the, the more traditional U.S. side, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, what was a decision to to sign uh, those agreements with, with with China was a very hard-fought political ba uh, battle internally within China. 
The other thing I'd say, though, is that historically, at different points over Japan's history, they, they've come to very um, broad definitions of what security means. And so I'd, comprehensive notions of security have often been led by key political figures, uh, which have helped to sort of bridge some of those um, uh, trade-offs that, that we might find unhelpful. So, so that might be another sort of productive way to think about that. Well, we've ha heard from our diverse panel, micro, macro, the real world, big <laughs> strategic um, issues. Uh, we didn't come to too many answers on the, the trade war, but I, I like the takeaways that, you know, we need to be working together in, in areas that do help multilateralize some of the issues, the IP protections and the infrastructure issues and, and, and other issues around that. Um, the bilateral relationship needs an oomph, like a, a big boot up the backside. Um, Don't although it's quote doing me well. on that. <laughs> well, that was me. <laughs> uh, and then all the difficult issues around the Japan-Korea relationship uh, and how Japan is is going to work that out, but also. Um, manage the US relationship and the China relationship. And I think we're going to come back to many more of the issues, these issues, in the session after lunch on the politics and foreign policy. But I think that's more than enough um, for now, and we can enjoy our lunch. So please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>